Ability. Hmm. There we go. Can you chaps see that all right? Are you, you're okay up there? Because there's cheap seats at the front. Right? Okay. Um, well, thanks very much uh, for the chance to speak tonight. And apologies if some of this kind of, in a way, repeats some of what Robin said. Robin, you could, you know, if you want to go and sit down there, you'll end up with a crane neck. I'm, I'm concerned about people's necks because I got a dodgy one myself. Um, probably everybody who has lived for some time in this country spends a lot of time trying to figure it out. And some of what Robin has said is kind of sitting under what I'm going to say. But I've tried to, I've spent a lot of time um, traveling to the Nordic countries and perhaps not so much um, picking up bare statistics, but noticing the way people operate, the way they live their lives, and then asking, why is it that we seem to be unable to have that level of um, equality of happiness, of expression, of just confidence. Um, and some of it is certainly to do with the constitutional setup in Scotland, and some of it is not. Some of it is some issues we have to deal with, whatever happens next year at 2014. And some of it is stuff that we have just simply looked the other way from for too long, I think. Um, this is, uh, I like this map. You can guess that it was uh, created by somebody in the Faroe Islands, eh? Um, but it's, it's nice in that it places Scotland in a different sort of context than you usually see it. And the question is, you know, if we were to become independent, what sort of Scotland would we have? And at the moment, you know, there's a strong danger that we become a kind of tartan England. Um, as somebody who grew up in Northern Ireland, um, Northern Ireland was run pretty well um, directly, direct rule from Westminster for decades. And without realising it, um, dr drank the Kool-Aid. You know, many of the presumptions of Westminster pretty well filtered through unquestioned in Northern Ireland. And to some degree, the same thing has happened here. Obviously, not completely. Scotland went into a union with its institutions intact. And that meant something quite different from Wales and Northern Ireland. We clearly have our own education system with its own outlook. We have our own legal system. You know all these things. But um, at the moment, where are we? I mean, Robin gave you some, in, some indicators. Um, if you look at things like turnout, for example, at elections, we're on, for local government elections last year, we're on a whopping 38%. Whoa. Now, we think that's not too bad because the English are on 32%. And if you go through a lot of indicators like that, we think we're doing a little bit better. We're sharing the gutter. When it comes to normal, and I know Alex Salmond is fond of talking about a normal state of affairs is to be your own country. There are many normals that you could look at, and I'd look, like to look at some other ones. A normal European country, a small European country, is regularly getting 70% turnouts for all elections, particularly local ones. Um, so the question is, why don't we pass muster in these degrees and does it matter? It strikes me it does. The other option is we could be uh, aiming higher. We could be looking to become a new Nordic democracy. Now that may sound a bit far-fetched, my family come from the far north of Scotland, from Caithness and Stroma, in fact, a small island off Caithness. So um, they take some persuading that they're actually Scottish sometimes because they're a bit thrown. Um, but there's a different possibility out there. As somebody who went from Belfast to Wick in one day, one awful day, before the A9 was duelled, before the bridges over all the firths north of Inverness, that was one hell of a drive. Um, it struck me that the North was not this frozen, infertile, barren landscape that we've been led to believe. It, was, it took going to the Nordic countries to realize um, that in fact, we are part of the Nor Nordic countries, fertile South, if you want to look at it that way. And which would you rather be? You know, part of the frozen North of Britain or part of the fertile South of the Nordics? It's not an either or, but it's a way of adjusting your perspective um, and that's been a, an interesting one for me. Scotland. Um, 
it seems to me it is the metaphor that's used in the book that I've just written, Blossom, um, is really looking at, if you like, at the kind of metaphor of a garden. And there are so many buds in Scotland. As somebody who came across the water at the age of 13, I already had my ideas formed by another country in, a, in some respects. And it always astonished me that certain things were not noticed in Scotland as being absolute jewels. And I would say tenements are one of them. Um, but the other thing is blight. What is causing these buds that we have here not to flourish? And the blight is inequality pretty well all the way down the line and chronic disempowerment. Now, that's not relative to England. If you stay in the United Kingdom, you'll never notice it. Um, the second you go to any better functioning, normal social democracy, which is what Scotland is trying to become, I think, um, you begin to notice pretty quickly we're really not passing muster very well at all. Good. I'm glad you heckled me too, because I would have felt left out if you didn't. Um, um, would, you, would you like me to go on, because then I'll be able to explain why? No, because... Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't... Sir, sir, could I, could I ask you something? Just, would you accept the, the will of the group here rather than mine? Uh, you do. You can accept the will of the, you can accept the will of the group or not. Would everybody here like to hear this, and then you can decide if it's crap? Yeah. Right. Now this is kind of a tale of two towns. Um, as I said earlier, my mother comes from Wick, and this is uh, another town, Hammerfest. It's the world's northernmost town, right at the tip of Norway. Um, and actually, it's so cold in Hammerfest that the kids, for the crack, throw boiling water into the air and watch it turn to ice. Um, these guys, you know, shouldn't be there. It's that cold. Anyway, in the 1900s, very similar towns. You can see there the pictures. You could swap them. They're almost identical. Wick was a massive herring port, and Hammerfest, well, pretty well every type of fish, was traded there. But things changed in the fortunes of these two, two, two towns, and they say something really about where Scotland is today. Two big things happened in Hammerfest that probably couldn't have happened here. One was, in 1897, Hammerfest became the first town in Northern Europe to get street lighting. Now, you may think that's near biggie, but if you've ever been in the Arctic winter, which is three months of solid blackness, that really means something. And what they did was they put a small hydro on the river behind Hammerfest, and they managed to get five street lights out of it. Whoa, five street lights. Um, they financed it by a, a tax on beer, which wasn't that popular with the fishermen, but still. Um, and it was hunky-dory until it ground to a halt one year in. They discovered, in fact, all they'd had a problem with was no one had ever put this in so far north. It wasn't insulated properly. When they fixed it, it ran perfectly well, and everyone got lights. Now, the thing that's significant about this is that those people there, because Hammerfest has been a commune that runs itself, a council, that owns much of its own land, that raises its own tax, and that can touch its natural assets. It could decide to go and put a hydro on a river. It didn't have to ask a laird. It didn't have to pay the Crown Estates Commission. It didn't have to go through a kind of complete confidence-boosting mind jump to think that something like that could be done. They just tried it. And then when they tried it and it did that for them, they thought, hang on a minute, supposing we put that same turbine in the Kvalsund Straits? Now, these straits are quite narrow, but they're not a patch on the Pentland Firth. Nothing is. Um, but it's still quite a nippy straits. They put that turbine in. They spent years perfecting the technology. They tested it, put it back in again. And that company is now Hammerfest Strom, the company whose turbines will power Isla as the world's first tidally powered island in hopefully 2015. And it should have been us. And that's what happens when you don't have access to your natural assets. It's not some dry abstraction. It's not some, some wafty kind of problem for people who just, you know, are particularly attached to the soil. It's that your own ideas are impossible to have as a practical outlet. 
And in Scotland today, we should have, we should have had hydroelectricity almost a century before we had it. Um, thanks to Tom Johnson, it finally came in around the Highlands and during the war, but it took the war to force that change. And we still have a situation where 1,000 people own 60% of the private land in Scotland. And there is no country in the developed world with that level of concentrated land ownership. Now, we could have done something about that, and we haven't. So, do we care? Does it matter? And it does. Because some of the points that Robin was talking about, this question about where does industry come from, well, where can it come from? If you can't even manage to produce the technology which can access the best tidal and marine resource in Northern Europe, we'll end up getting it from someone else. The other thing that was significant here is housing, which I always think is very overlooked in the story of a nation. Um, after the war, um, in Finnmark, which is where Hammerfest is, uh, the Germans burnt everything when they retreated in 1944. They were trying to make it impossible for the Red Army to get traction. There was three churches left in an area the size of Denmark. Um, and yet the people went straight back to rebuild their lives. And Husbanken, which was the National Housing Bank, was set up with a principle or an outlook which speaks volumes about the way that the state regarded the capacity of its people. And what that was, was they basically gave people a bit of money to go away and build their own houses. And to this day, about a tenth of Norwegian housing is self-built. And that doesn't mean that a tenth of Norwegians are builders. It means folk work together to pool their skills in what's called dugnad, which is community self-help, to build their houses. Now, that matters a lot because what it meant was people just got on with it, did their own thing, and built their own houses. They were owners of them. They were active in their community. And they had something that they could borrow on. If they went to live in, in cities, um, they clearly couldn't build their own tenements, but what they did was they became cooperative owners of flats within little housing co-ops. That may sound a bit obscure, but I'll show you in a minute how that matters. This is me pal, Inger Lisa Matheson, who's standing in front of the Kvalsun Strait with the successful turbine sitting behind it. That's Hammerfest, a pretty frisky little city uh, now in the north of uh, Norway. It has the world's northernmost liquid natural gas plant. It has the Hurtigruten passes through. It's quite a happening place. This, to me, is the face of an independent-minded, capable people who are regarded as having capacity by their government. This, these are the wifeys on the, on the left here. I stopped these two old ladies when they just wheeled down a practically a one-in-one -one slope in the snow on these wooden sleighs. And all the old people, in fact, everybody has these wooden sleighs in the, in the far north. Now, can you imagine in Scotland, you know, the second there's snow, everybody's grounded, particularly older people. They don't even go out. But look at that woman there with a the wee red glows in her cheeks there. That she's, she is the face of what you want in a nation, which is someone who knows that she's capable of going out and taking care of herself, wouldn't dream of being penned up indoors, and is presumed to have the capacity to do that. My worry about Scotland is that constantly all forms of government have presumed us to be incapable, um, to have no capacity, to have to have stuff done for us to have a sort of stand there till we fix you kind of approach. And if we try to get in and about, if we try to get involved in our lives, then it kind of messes everything up for the professionals because we've moved a bit. That's not the kind of society that produces independent-minded people. And for me, I would, I would be happy to, to live with any outcome of an independent-minded set of people. This is what I think they've got. Just by the by, that's the huts that everybody goes off to at the weekend in the Nordic countries. Again, it's easy to have them because land prices are very low. You do see a relationship. When prices are low, people consume it a lot. It's cheap to drink and eat here, so we ate our wealth. It's cheap to have land there, so they have huts everywhere and go there for the weekend. Um, there's Wick. 
Now you know this could be small town practically anywhere in Scotland because Wick just atrophied. It's, uh, it is no longer has port status as a town. It's run from Inverness, although there's been an attempt to kind of have a group of councillors that meet at least. But as, as Robin said, this is unusual across Europe. We are not normal. The normal thing is to have little councils of maybe about 14,000. And I'll say, when people talk about this, there's not many tears wept for the loss of perhaps the old days here, because we had parish councils about that size, but they were run by the great and the good. We have not known truly democratic, truly local structures in Scotland, and you didn't miss what you've never had. So at the moment, we're sitting on big, and there's a template of largeness, I think, in Scotland, which probably arises from the feudal sporting estates and the size of them, but we're now marking it with our democracy. It's supersized as well. We lose traction, we lose involvement, and um, that marks us out as very different. Um, you can't see that very well at the top, but here's a good illustration. This is Scotland as it is at the moment, 32 councils. And the one on the right is how Scotland would be if we had the average number of European councils. Now that's a stunner, isn't it? That's not, that's the average, it's not the most. France is crazily local. They have communes of 79 people. Um, you could have a kind of large family. In fact, you could get the five flyers in and they could run the place. But you know, that, that on the right is what we would look like if we were somewhere near normal. So it's, it's worth thinking about. That's how not local we've become. That's what we've got. Our average council is 162,000. The Nordics keep getting picked on. The Germans are about the same. It's not just the Nordics that have this characteristic. And there's the, the thing. At the delivery level, you know, the area where you really know people, that's the average budget for a community council, 400 quid. That's the lowest budget in Europe for that delivery level of council. And some of you may say, well, do you know, so what? They're a bunch of gatekeepers, they don't do anything useful, whatever, whatever. Well, not surprising. There's no statutory functions for a, a community council, and there's not even a limit on the number of folk who can be elected. So it just creates no focus whatsoever, and it seems everybody's happy to leave it that way. Um, our turnout I mentioned earlier. But here's another thing. That's how many Scots stand for election, one in 2071. Um, in Norway, where you've got those smaller councils and you know folk, is one in 80. So, you know, you or your family, you know people, you are who is elected. And that has all sorts of uh, ramifications. You know, Russell Brand was going on about it. He doesn't vote because just encourages them. I mean, some of that is about the way that parties have taken over. Because if you don't know who you're voting for, and you can't possibly know who you're voting for in a council of 162,000 people, the only demarcation has got to be the party flag. In most other countries, folk are elected because they are the capable activists everybody knows is basically running the place single-handed. In Iceland, you can even write in who you'd like to have stand, even if they didn't stand. And if enough folk vote for them, they feel morally bound to take the job. Now, you know, it's a different way of looking at it. Now, this, what, I'd like just one important thing. This is not to beat ourselves up. This is to say this is not a good situation by European standards. And there's some reasons. In 1814, the Norwegians nearly got away. And they were part of Denmark. Denmark had gone to war on the wrong side with Napoleon. Napoleon lost. All his goodies were being shared out by the Allies. And for a wee minute, the Norwegians thought they could be an independent country. So they gathered, 112 guys were gathered by their prince in a place called Eidsvoll, and they wrote a constitution in five weeks. And because this was just in the wake of the French Revolution, it was probably one of the most radical constitutions ever written. But it had at the heart of it something that wasn't very radical. It said it would enfranchise all male, well it was those days, all male landowners. Now, overnight in Norway, because of how many people owned land, 45% got 
got the vote. The same legislation in 1832 in our reform bill gave 5% the vote. The story since then has been predictable. In Norway, the Danish elite, if you like, um, the professionals had to win the confidence and the support of the peasants or the folk that lived out and about. You couldn't win with, with half the population voting. You couldn't sit in an ivory tower and top down manage anything. It couldn't be done. But in Britain, the kind of deals that were done were always done by the elites because only 5% of folk were voting. And that matters. It characterises the kind of democracy that we've had. It's a kind of thin thing. It's a, it's, it's a superficial thing to some degree, and it doesn't involve us enough. A couple of other points. Housing, I mentioned earlier. Some of you might recognise this beautiful painting by Averill Patton of a tenement in Glasgow. I was astonished coming across the water. It's terrace housing like Coronation Street in Belfast. Um, and these tenements are great in that they, they have a tremendous density. Um, it's found that people will only walk five minutes to public transport. If you've got tenemental cities, you've got four times more people walking five minutes. So you get much better use of every public service. Tenements had a terrible reputation because they were overcrowded. And it has to be said that predates the Union and Scots did that to Scots. Um, we had appalling overcrowding at one stage, something like 10, 10 times worse than London, right up until 1951. So tenements got us saddled with a bad name because of that overcrowding, and yet they are the ideal size and height for the density of a functioning city. And the proof is, when you go to any other European city, you see them. You'll have been to other European cities and thought, by God, this is like Glasgow, Edinburgh, whatever. And there is the Palamines tenement in Oslo. It's not that different till you look at the back. Now, this is a kind of pretty crappy tenement in Edinburgh, and one not very unlike it in Copenhagen, except that because, if you remember earlier, all the Nordics tend to be cooperative owners of flats. There'll be a cooperative that owns a block. And what that means is that they have, um, they have managed to shield themselves against big increases in the market because there's some control on prices. But more interestingly, they've retrofitted two-person lifts onto the back close of every tenement. Now, that's smart because it means with an increasingly older population, older folk can live on any floor of the tenement. Now, do. I mean, that... If, you'd love to think that could happen here, but with councils as cash-strapped as they are, in your dreams. But nobody in the Nordics expects to wait for a council because they and their smaller units than that have been saving and putting money away for just these practical purposes. They also have solar panels. They've had them for 10 years. They have back courts that aren't no man's lands. They're actually quite pleasant with not just the dunnies. So, you know, it's this question of once you crack things down to be smaller and to get away from what Robin described earlier, this us and them dynamic where the winner takes all, you begin to get meaningful society budding up and growing. Now, in the United Kingdom, our tenemental structures mean we're the only people who've got the chance to do this. We could have district heating in overnight to build on the point made about energy. Again, that's been standard in other countries where councils, like uh, Sweden, has 91 ener local energy companies run by councils. That's what they regard municipal duties as being, supplying essential monopolies to their people. And it makes sense, because instead of having however many boilers there are as folk in this room, you have one boiler, albeit quite a lot of pipes, but you have one system, one thing to be fixed, and when you get a better energy supply, one change. And that's why so many of those countries have shifted to more sustainable forms of fuel, because they have one change to make. We didn't do it. Why didn't we do it? We had the same housing type, we had municipal councils, we weren't thinking small enough and we weren't thinking cooperatively. Some people were. This is a, perhaps, I think, some of the bravest folk in Scotland. Um, this is a housing 
cooperative called West Whitleburn in Rutherglen. And then they, in the 1980s, these folk realized they were never going to get their houses fixed. They were living in high-rise blocks. The council got some money to fix some of the area. And it decided to spend it on East Whitlowburn because they were low-rise and easier to fix. So the West Whitlowburn folk realised they were going to be saddled with verandas that were falling to pieces, windows that were leaking, all the problems that came from those high-rise blocks that were flung up in a hurry for life. And um, because there was a Tory government at the time keen to manage to wrestle council housing away from councils, there was a moment where they could get in and argue to become cooperative owners of the housing. Now, you just think about this for a minute. These were the poorest folk in Glasgow with the worst housing. And that probably means they were the poorest folk in Europe with the worst housing in Europe. And they had the confidence or the nerve or the something or the desperation to decide that they would take this into their own hands and manage it themselves when the council couldn't. Now, that takes courage. And uh, Phil Al Muriel Alcorn and Phil Welsh, um, who were two of the pioneers, went round trying to drum up support. Um, they managed to get about 60% behind them, but they said that's not enough. They needed to get 75. About six months later, they got that and they went for it. And they've made some incredible changes. Um, you may not think this sounds terribly salubrious, but there's 175 CCTV cameras in their flats. And what that means is there's no drug dealers. There's also 11 lives have been saved because they've spotted people having epileptic fits, um, old people falling, and they've made quite an intervention in people's lives. They have a 24-hour Janny control so that if old folk are feeling just anxious in the night, they can buzz and the Jannies will come up and speak to them. Now that really matters too, because in a, an annual period, Scotland spent 2.5 billion, and this is extraordinary, admitting old folk to hospital who had no emergency condition. They were simply alone. They were anxious. They had maybe had a slight fall, and there was nobody there to do anything for them. And when you get something that's smaller like this, a cooperative that's 839 houses, flats in there, that's the right size to be able to manage your own folk. Because these guys were also smart enough to go to be a fully mutual cooperative, they actually managed to avoid the whole right to buy. And that could have been done by every uh, housing association had they moved to that fully mutual status. That would have made a difference. But it wasn't really discussed or thought about because we don't do cooperatives. We have done council housing. And that's a different outlook. We could have changed and we can still change. And finally, you know, the most important thing is got to be children. Um, again, it was mentioned earlier uh, about the different situation and the huge contribution um, there is to women working in Norway. But the difference you can see is in the children. And the way it works is that the right to a kindergarten place, an affordable kindergarten place, resides in the child, not, not the mother. So what that means is, in Norway, for example, you don't pay more than £200 a month for a full-time nursery place. Now, if you think that's impressive, bear in mind that the Norwegian currency is about two to three times stronger than ours. So you're talking about 80 quid maximum. And what, what normally happens is the kids are outdoors. Again, some of you might have seen this. It comes as quite a surprise. You can see the kids are out in minus 18 or whatever. They have an everyone system, so regardless of if somebody's a bit richer than somebody else, there's wee zoot suits there for all the kids in the class, and there's the same suits for the adults, because it's usually us turning up that spoils the fun, because we're the gatekeepers, not the wains. But they spend, they also co-locate with farms. Now, can you imagine that here, with all the worry there is about health and safety? because they think that actually the kids' immune systems are strengthened by having contact with animals rather than the opposite. The kids in this Medus kindergarten, um, they go in and take the, they feed the animals, they collect the eggs very carefully, wash them, and they go on the weekends and sell them in town to raise money for the kindergarten. They grow their own tomatoes, they make their own hay, and the one day there is nobody absent from the kindergarten is when a dead coo gets dissected. That is a big moment. And I was quite surprised about that and said, 
do you never get any parents sort of complaining or any kids sort of fainting or whatever? And they looked at me as if I was an absolute imbecile. And I felt like one. And they said, it's just interesting, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is, it is. But this is, again, what is born out of having direct contact with what's sensible and being able to get on with it. Here's what happened when somebody tried to do the same in Scotland, in Coatbridge. Um, some Norwegians actually tried to set up the same type of kindergarten. And the council, first of all, said that some paedophiles might come and watch the kids. So they had to put this wooden thing up round the kindergarten. And the long bench that they had, which is a characteristic of Nor Norwegian kindergarten, is a long, long bench, which encourages the sharing and all the stuff that makes these things work. Um, this was deemed um, unsafe because if a kid got on top of the bench and jumped onto its head, it could hurt itself. And this, to me, this also arises from the largeness of the way we work. Because you know yourself, if you are absent from your kids, you tend to be our pernickety. You tend to be too you, be prescriptive. You're thinking, what if, what if, what if? If you're in there in the moment, you can make better judgments. But too often, the folk who are running things are not there because of the largeness of everything that we do. I was very involved with Egg, um, which was a very good example of a set of people who'd been told they were worth nothing. And that was true of every political party. Nobody helped them at a formal level at all. Um, this is Keith Schellenberg in one of his many mansions. Um, and on the right, some of the more recent people who have come to live on Egg, which has really had an ex extraordinary success story. Um, but what it's proved to me is the same people who actually felt completely disempowered, who did, couldn't even complain about the kind of nonsense that was happening on the island for decades, have cheerfully changed to the kind of people who can plan, make very sane and cooperative decisions. The first house that was, re that was uh, renovated by the Isle of Egg building company, which was done by all the men becoming part of a cooperative so that the one guy who was a builder wouldn't get all the contracts and wouldn't be boycotted uh, socially for having that done. Um, that first house, there was a couple of options. There could be an old lady from the mainland who was an Egg native returning. There was two, two girls who were good friends. And there was one guy who had a, a farming job. And unusually for the allocations policy, the house went to the two lassies, who were friends, who live there still, who've got their own families. But it was those kind of intuitive decisions to just change the mix. Because in lots of these communities, it's girls that leave first. It's not men that leave depo depopulating areas. So when you've got that level of control, you can start to make clever decisions. Um, this too is a shocker. Has anybody ever gone up the A9? You know when you go that past Pitlochry, past Blair Athol, and you start to rise up and up past Calvin, and you get to what looks like a sort of desert. Um, now, this is the final point I want to make because I think this is so important. In the same way as I think we've been sold a bit of a pup, about the general lack of capacity in the Scottish population, we've been sold one hell of a pup about the fertility of Scottish land. Um, this is Ron Greer and Derek Pretzwell, who are two ecologists in Perthshire, and they decided to just prove that you could actually have these big green <coughs> desert areas turn into something quite viable. 25 years ago, they managed to rent a bit of ground, they fenced it off so the sheep and deer um, couldn't get in, and they started planting lupins. Now, this is where I came in because lupins are my favorite plant, and everyone thought they were mad. They planted lupins and broom because that put nitrogen back into the soil, and the little trees that were growing up through it got shelter, and it raised the temperature just enough for them to grow. And actually, that had failed in every previous attempt. Um, what they've managed to create there, you can only really see a bit of it, is an incredible verdant woodland with ras wild raspberries and all sorts of, just it's a beautiful place. Um, what they were going to go on once they proved themselves, they were going to go on and buy 100,000 acres of Perthshire supported by Scottish Enterprise. And the deal was all about to happen when 
somebody noticed they had no academic qualifications. I mean, they'd only proved that they could do it by waiting for 20 years to actually show what could be done. But there was just this hesitation. Who were they? Were, why would you invest faith in people who'd only shown they could do something and the deal foundered? Um, at the same time, they had made another suggestion to a place that we all know now, which is the rest and be thankful. And if their planting techniques had been used then, I'd guarantee we wouldn't be sitting watching landslides the whole time on that place. These guys are angry. Um, Ron is an obsessive and quite difficult man these days, and he'd take that as a compliment. Um, and it's no surprise. There are many, many people in, like, like in Scotland like that today. People who have given their all. People who believed that we're all Jock Tamsin's bairns. People who thought that a man's a man for all that in this society and found that actually it's still who you know. It's still belonging to the establishment and it's still a kind of tiny range that's exploited of our capacity. And that's just not good enough. I'm going to skip through that because the ultimate disempowerment is experienced by people at the very lowest margins of society, at the poorest people. And the link between poverty and lack of opportunity is so rigid, it's just quite staggering. This shows you that 2.8% of babies are underweight in the 10% poorest areas. There's the 10% richest areas. It's 1.1%. This tells you again about the number of crimes in these different uh, neighbourhoods, the 10 richest, the 10% richest, the 10% poorest. And each time they're dramatically different outcomes. This perhaps is the most shocking. Um, you've heard of the Scottish effect and this looks at why Scots everywhere, but particularly this was looking at Glasgow and across all classes are dying younger than their compatriots, if you like, their counterparts in the rest of the UK. And the Centre for Population Health made this comparison between Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester in areas with equal levels of social deprivation. It may be hard to read the graph, but you see the blue line that's going through the middle. That's telling you where Liverpool and Manchester are at in each of the kind of causes of death that are in the columns grisly little graph, this one. On the, on the left are the things that you might think were the reason that Scots do worse. Cancer, heart disease, these kind of things. And you'll see that actually in those respects we're not that different than Liverpool and Manchester. Where Glasgow pulls away is on suicide, violence, drug abuse and alcohol abuse. If you like, these are illnesses of hopelessness. These are social illnesses. And what does that arise from? To me, it arises from probably living with absolute certainty that your life chances probably won't change and having no capacity whatsoever to do something about it yourself because of these large units that stop you having the capacity to be able to fix things yourself. And if we don't try to change these things, we'll continue to have people like Tommy Riley here, who set up the Drumchapel Men's Health Project in 1996, a brave thing to do in Drumchapel, where you know surviving the estates then was a question of trying to look hard and just pass the pain down to vulnerable people smaller than you. That's the way it worked. Uh, Tommy decided to try not to do that. Some other guys joined him and they set up a men's health centre. They got one year's funding. Some of you will be familiar with that one. Um, and they managed to put uh, together aromatherapy classes in Drum Chapel. They had a waiting list. Um, they had acupuncture for, for guys trying to kick smoking. And the biggest buy-in was cookery classes. They had an 18-week waiting list for that. And they were getting somewhere. They were changing themselves together. They were changing their lives. Um, and then the money just ran out. The Greater Glasgow Health Board didn't renew the money. Um, no explanation was given. Does it ever get given? Does it need to be given? Um, and Tommy took it very badly. Uh, he, before this thing started, was the only guy who didn't drink. He became an alcoholic. It took me some time to find him when I was writing the book. 
Um, I did finally find him through some of the other guys. Um, at that stage, he had COPD, um, and he died three months ago. Now, Tommy is the Scottish effect. This is not nothing for people to have nowhere to put the energy that they're trying to give to their community. And if we don't crack Scotland down into small enough dynamic communities so that we can begin to move forward, we won't realise the differences that our neighbours, who are independent countries, have managed to realise. Because it's not just being independent that's given them independent mindedness. It's the chance every day to know through actions and through practical life moments that the people they're sitting amongst are a capable crew that you'd sail with anywhere. And I wonder, with many folk further of this room, when they think of the question of independence, I don't think they're assessing the capacity of Alex Salmon necessarily and the SNP crew to run Scotland. They're assessing all of our capacity. Because after all, if we're going to do something, it's us we need to rely on. We're going to do the heavy lifting. And in a way, it would have been impressive if instead of trying to persuade us about the capacity of the government, the government was trying to persuade us about our own capacity. Because that's the thing we doubt. That's the thing we haven't had the chance to demonstrate. And that's the bit, I think, that we need to fix. So thanks for listening.